Um, my name's Rohan. Um, I write a blog and do other things. Um, I'd, I'm, uh, I thought I'd be provocative this morning. Um, not for its own sake, but that's good too. Um, but because what I'm talking about is what is on my mind and um, how I'm spending my time. So um, my alternative title for this talk was more provocative. Um, uh, and what I want to talk today is about innovation. I'll talk about what that means um, and uh, why I think we're not doing it right and why, how I think we could do it right and why we need to do it right. Um, so uh, that's where we'll start. So we'll start with a bit of history. Um, we all know, we've heard many speakers already before, uh, Diane this morning and Shinzen on Friday. We all know that the history of Buddhism is one of innovation and change and evolution, as Diane talked about. And um, that's, the that's the beautiful sort of narrative of Buddhism as it's gone all the way through. Um, but what, I, what, I, what do I mean by innovation in my context? I mean about like when stuff happens like the iMac. So um, when I talk about innovation, I'm not just talking about technology, but that's a, a big part of it. But what I mean is when, I think it was 1998, when, um, before 1998, if you can remember before, before then, um, uh, computers were beige, ugly bricks that sat under your table and they were just very functional devices. What happened in 1998 was that Apple shipped the iMac and suddenly the computer became a design item, a thing you wanted to have in your bedroom, in your room and show off. And suddenly uh, maintained its functionality. In fact, it improved its functionality because obviously Macs and PCs have different ways of working and way different. Um, but this, this for me, so that, that moment in sort of personal computing history for me symbolizes a moment in which there was a radical change in how we perceived computer devices. And the rest is history in a certain sense, because obviously like that was a really big moment for the Apple Corporation in how the design aesthetic became embedded into their work. And that's why that, and that, that emphasis on design is uh, a really important reason of where they are now. Um, okay, that's Steve Jobs, um, 1998. Let's go back to, oh, we always say 2,500 years ago, so let's go back to that bit. Um, so, uh, uh, the Buddha, I love the Buddha, um, not only because, <laughs> for all the obvious reasons, um, but also uh, for, so, okay, so, um, uh, Four Noble Truths, the uh, Dharma uh, Chakrapodhita Sutta, in uh, Sarnath, really lovely place to go and visit. Um, uh, the museum there is amazing in Sarnath, if you've not been. Um, um, and for me, that moment, not when he, not the awakening itself, but that first talk, the first sermon, was what I call um, the start of the awakening industry. So Buddhism became, <laughs> Buddhism, Buddhism, Buddhism um, it turned from the realization of an individual into an industry of awakening. Um, uh, uh, where the five disciples, suddenly there was transmission, there was understanding, there was insight, and suddenly a whole new industry was born. And that, I'm interested in when industries are born. That's, that's quite interesting. So you'll hear, language like, you'll hear language like industry, which you might not like. Oh yes, yesterday we talked about um, conservers and adapters. Um, conservers might not like my talk. <laughs> um, adapters might not like my talk. Um, uh, but there you go. So, um, so, so the Four Noble Truths started the awakening industry. But as well, what I really like about that talk, well, lots of things I really like about um, that uh, sort of is amazing, but um, it's interesting that Ken said that he's a, uh, uh, works as a management consultant that I used to and sort of still do. Um, and Shinzen spoke about the Buddha as the first proto-scientist. I actually see the Buddha as the first proto-management consultant. Because what um, he did in that sutta was the most extraordinary bit of codification you've ever seen. And through the next 35 years, um, 45 years of his teaching mission, you saw a man codifying some of the most complex messaging and communication the planet's ever seen in extraordinarily simple um, and not simple, but um, uh, accessible ways. Um, and that's what management consultants do. 
Um, and so the Four Noble Truths, let's go, let's, uh, so it's a bit of a cliche um, in Dharma circles to sort of trot out the Four Noble Truths. What am I going to talk about today? I don't know. What list can I go to? Four Noble Truths. That's a banker. I'll roll out my Four Noble Truths talk. Um, that happens a lot. I've seen that. Um, and so let's, so I'm going to use the Four Noble Truths as a structure for my talk. Um, so for him, it was suffering, cause, freedom, and path. For me, I'll talk about problem, cause, uh, vision, and path um, with regards to the seven. So, what's the problem? Um, uh, in what are the problems I see right now? I see a problem with popularity. Um, uh, we talked about milk mindfulness yesterday. Um, I'm going to be serving up some milk mindfulness with extra fries later on, so be ready. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so. Popularity is, is one of the, so Ethan talked about, um, there's the sort of double-edged sword of a lot, double-edged sword of a lot of these issues. And so with popularity comes the issue of maintaining authenticity. And that's something that we're all really passionate about. Um, how do you maintain the integrity and the transformative vision of this practice and this work and the authenticity of the, um, uh, all the values that underpin the tradition so far in the, in the mess, um, of where we are in our culture and the convergence rather of all the different elements. So that's a, that's a problem. Um, I also uh, personally um, feel that, uh, I have a, again a provocative statement, I say that the aesthetic of meditation is broken. Um, and I'm, when I talk about that, I don't, I'm, I'm talking less about to people in the room here. I'm talking to people who, like several times a week, I will speak to um, just, uh, not my allowed to say normal people. Um, uh, <laughs> Normal people um, who uh, invariably I'll start talking about meditation or Buddhism if we meet in a social situation and they'll say, oh, that sounds really interesting. I've always wanted to do that. Or a friend of mine's always wanted to do it, but there's always a but. There's actually two main buts that I come across. One is um, it takes too much time and the other is uh, it's too hippie. Um, and those for me are aesthetic. They're sort of the way that um, uh, meditation is presented. I think one of my real takeaways from Jane's talk yesterday was that um, she was, it was really exciting to see that sense of how she found her experience of meditation to be an engaging one, but it doesn't look like that on the packet. Um, and uh, there's something, uh, there's something, uh, so I'm, I'm, so the people I talk to are all, they live in sort of urban centers in, in England and Scotland and Europe. Um, they're digital, they're, they're relational, and uh, something's not landing for them. Um, but the, the, the power and the interest in this work, that doesn't go away, but the, the wrapping paper maybe needs some updating. Um, another problem I see generally around is, so we talk about industries, uh, uh, Buddhism as an awakening industry. Other industries are collapsing right now. This is not news. Um, uh, Newspapers, publishing, music, film, content industries are collapsing, um, uh, disrupted by technology, um, but more importantly, disrupted by the behaviors which technology enable. Um, and I work, so my day job, I work for some of the biggest arts organizations in the UK, um, actually the biggest arts, organization, biggest arts festival on the planet, the Edinburgh festivals. And um, uh, when I talk to them, I talk to them about how, look, just look around you. So you're, so in the performing arts, um, because the, uh, because the, the core experience of the performing arts is live experience. It's theater, it's dance, it's opera and all that. Um, that, that live experience cannot be digitally replicated. Whereas the core, uh, material of the other industries, music and so on can be digitally replicated because MP3s can be, transferred and file shared. So people in the arts, uh, when I start talking about collapses of industries, they say, oh, but are, are, are we safe? Um, because uh, it's all about the live and people come to see, come, still coming to our events and our festivals. I say, you're, you're safe in this first wave of collapse because, because you're, you're safe from that issue of replication. But your industry is about attention in the sense of People, the leisure industry, the arts is all about is, is uh, selling attention and interesting experience. And if you're and uh, if every and uh, if uh, when Jane showed the slide of 800 million gamers around the world, that's people's attention. And the arts should better be scared. And I'm telling like the, the the directors of the world's biggest festival saying, in 10 years you're facing market collapse 
because everyone else is going, everyone is going to be gamers and won't want to come to Edinburgh and see the best art on the planet. Um, what are you going to do about it? So this is my, my provocation and challenge is that we have to learn from the other collapses that are going on and just try to be, be, be a bit smart about it because none of the other industry, like we sort of think, it's, oh, it's happening to them? Oh yeah, of course it's happening to music, but it won't happen to us. Um, uh, I, I think there will be, a, there, uh, we just have to be smarter about the stuff that's going on in the context and um, recognize that there's some things broken and there might be some things breaking. Um, so that's a problem. Um, let's think of some causes. I don't think, so my background again is mainly in the sort of insight Vipassana Theravada thing. Um, uh, and uh, I, I don't think we're very resilient. And resilience is something that we, I sort of talk about in my work a lot or around just if, if, if stuff changes quickly, are we gonna, how, how can we deal with it? And it's really interesting, like, again, like, the reason I like, we like sort of Jane's work, sort of the idea of sort of uh, modeling different types of shock and like in a, in a gaming environment. But are we resilient? And why are we not resilient? Um, we emphasize free a lot. Um, and I'm less interested in free, I'm more interested in sustainable. Um, uh, because uh, the economics of free are, um, I think it's a, it's a false economics to think of it as free because someone always paid. Someone paid for a million people to walk to the sea in the Gandhi salt marshes. That was not free. There were people bankrolling that stuff. Um, and likewise, um, uh, the, the Buddha's original mission, um, Pasanadi, Bimbisara, massive uh, patrons who, um, uh, Ananda Pindaka famously, uh, they were, the, so the teachings were given by teachers in the spirit of, free, in, of generosity and openness and no transaction but the infrastructure behind it was not free. But I'm interested in sustainable, not free. So, let, so I think if we shift our mindset to be about sustainability, um, then uh, that's good. Um, buildings, this is interesting. Um, uh, when you run a retreat center or, or a urban center, whatever, you spend most of your time, many of you might be doing this already, you spend most of your time fundraising about build maintenance rather than programs. Um, and this is directly from my experience working with theatres and arts organisations. Arts organisations' main mission is to create cultural value, to excite and inspire. But the reality of the organisations is that they're spending all their time pay, trying to raise money to keep the lights on. Um, and th so there's a disconnect between the organisational aspect of all, the, like, all they want to do is put on art, well, all the artists want to do is put on art, but all the arts organizations want to do is uh, keep, make sure there's toilet paper in the bathrooms. And that's really expensive, because um, uh, the scale and the size of theaters and retreat centers is not insignificant. And so we've got heavy built infrastructure in the, in the Buddhist scene, and we're serving, uh, we're serving a lot of that. When Imagine if all the investment that went into um, Wing, main, wing maintenance and so on went into developing new programs. We'll come to that. Um, leadership. Uh, this is sort of just a, uh, the generation panel this, uh, was really interesting yesterday. I think um, this isn't, we can't ignore 800 gamers, 800 million gamers. We can't ignore, we might not like it. We might not like mindfulness. We might not like the stuff that's happening in our culture, um, but I feel that we should either be aware of it and conscientiously object or engage with it in some way. Um, if we just ignore, um, I don't think that's cool. Um, so I just think there's a, there's a hole where I'm not seeing, um, uh, like, I, I, I just, there are, I'm speaking incredible generalizations. Like obviously, like you, can, you can all find examples of people who are doing some really interesting stuff, but I think generally, because Again, I'll just go back to my day job, this might sound familiar, where um, I spend most of my time between people and organizations who have power, central government, large organizations, um, who uh, want to engage in, in this, in my personal case, with sort of digital practice. So over here you've got the power, and over here you've got the geeks with their MacBooks and their Twitter streams. And the power is saying, I really want to get it, but I don't know what to do. 
and the geeks are going, you don't get me, you don't get me. Um, uh, uh, so, this, and, uh, but the problem is the power is here, typically, in arts organizations, the power, like, the, we're talking about 40 to 60 year olds, artists and directors, exec directors of some of the most powerful cultural organizations in Europe, and, but the, it's a generational thing. Because of the speed of change of technology, we've, uh, because, uh, 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 because of the speed of change that happens so quickly, um, the, the literacy um, is not there. And so uh, they, we need to create some ways of filling that hole of literacy in cultural trends, potential of digital, and so on. So, main point, um, what's the vision? Um, that's the bad news. Obviously, like, this is the great thing about the, like, the Four Noble Truth technique of codification, get the bad news out. But it's actually all about the, sec the last three, the last two. Um, it's like, because it, uh, uh, it's quite good. I actually think he's actually also a brilliant marketer. Um, <laughs> read, well, re read the Satipatthana Sutta thinking, where's the marketing in this? And um, you might find it interesting. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, innovation, the vision is, um, I, my vision is of a systematic, uh, or an ecology of innovation within the Buddhist scene, where organizations, so this is a, um, I'll come to the picture, but uh, where we recognize all the various parts and understand the ecology, we live in this really vibrant ecology of traditions, organizations, practitioners, um, recognizing how those people and groups can connect to each other. So the big retreat houses, so big retreat houses or big organizations, they hold, that, they hold the intellectual capital, the teaching depth, the quality. What are they doing to talk to uh, the entrepreneurs, the people with the actual um, new ideas, like, and how are they collaborating together? I'm not talking about making a better website, I'm talking about changing the way, changing the way the computing is perceived like an iMac. I'm talking about the big changes, and the big changes don't come from the industry. So in the arts, in England, like, um, so, uh, like the, so, so recently, a couple of months ago, a, a music streaming service launched in the UK, it's a European product called Spotify. Um, which is completely, which is a live streaming music service. And uh, that, like, the really radical ideas don't come from the incumbent power. They come from the fringes. But, but the, uh, but the um, incumbent power really wants to, so it really wants to find the next big thing. So IBM are looking for, what's the next big consumer product thing that, I, like, but IBM doesn't, IBM will never do it. Zuckerberg does it. Every, like uh, like uh, the 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 fringe entrepreneurs do it because they because that's where the energy and the vision and the because um, the real radical innovation comes from conversations like we've been having here today like the meeting people with a similar viewpoint but sufficient difference to spark something that we're, whoa that's a really new idea but um, uh, so. And that doesn't come from power, that comes from the fringe. So the, but the power needs to talk to the fringe, because other, otherwise, the fringe, the fringe is gonna do it anyway. This is what I'm saying, the fringe is gonna do it anyway, but in, the, in our case, um, uh, we, we won't care if the big four record labels in the US die, who cares, right? But, and all, all, to, all power to the young indie music entrepreneurs who are putting more money in the um, musicians' pockets and taking the middle guy out of the way, that's great. But when people start disrupting our industry, if we don't play, the quality is going to be shit. Because it'll be all milk mindfulness. And the quality, and uh, the depth and the shallow, like the, t the people who have the understanding, the teachers, the houses, the traditions, the lineages, must start innovating with the fringe. Um, uh, I love the mind life sort of dialogue like image that uh, Shinzen had of the Dalai Lama and the psychology dude talking. Um, I'd also like, uh, um, uh, I, I really like talking, but I, I most prefer making. So I, my, my vision, so someone really interesting, JP said, what's next year's Buddhist Geeks about? In my head, there's a whole track where we build stuff, where we take the unplugged idea and actually start flocking teams and thinking about actual real concepts and so, but that's, um, 
Yeah. Oh, back, please, Jacob. Oh. Yes. So that just to contextualize the image, this is an image from a thing called Y Combinator, which is another cliche. But Y Combinator is a, um, a project in San Francisco, or probably around the Bay Area, not the city, um, which is a, a six month startup incubator um, for this guy, Paul Graham, and his colleagues. They pick up. Uh, really like high potential teams from all around the world and bring them to Mountain View um, and over six months give them a, the most intense business boot camp, entrepreneurial boot camp, um, and uh, out of it comes some products that you probably already use. So um, I, my vision is of spiritual startups, Buddhist startups. We need Buddhist startups. If you want to tweet something, let's tweet that because... <laughs> Like uh, Buddhist startups, but with the proviso that the incumbent power and depth of Dharma understanding is part of the team. Because, um, like I'm saying, like I'm saying, because we will see there's a market opportunity in mindfulness, and people will take advantage of that. Um, so let's play. Because if we don't play, it'll be rubbish, and we will our industry will collapse. That's it. So how do we get there? Um, uh, investment. We need money. Um, uh, we need, uh, so um, I see, so I've worked a lot in what's called social enterprise in England, social innovation, and what we've seen, and it, there's a great scene here in the US as well, the UK is probably the strongest in Europe, um, of, so social enterprise being uh, organizations, businesses, which, whose primary output, primary goal is social value, but they're also um, commercial, so they have a twin, um, but social value is number one. Here, we're talking about an evolution of that idea of social enterprise into spiritual enterprise or dharma enterprise, where, again, the primary value should be uh, spiritual value. Um, but we're talking about sustainable and not free, so let's make them robust enterprises. And to do that requires all the infrastructure that creates great startups. So we need to, as a community, work out, let's stop uh, building new buildings, and take a bit of that money into uh, an investment fund, which does R&D. Um, this is what we need. Um, we need uh, research and development of what the next wave of uh, Buddhist innovation looks like. And the people in the room here are the people I want to be working with to do that. And so we need to have better conversations of, actually, like, this is a nice idea, but um, where where is the, um, like, we need to sort of, there's a, uh, there's a need to just more structures. Because this stuff doesn't happen by accident. Great products do not happen by accident. Um, you, can, like, you, can buy, you can buy all the sort of garage, myth, garage myths of Google and Apple and Facebook all started with an idea like back And it sort of did. But, all, but behind that is like venture capital, structure, boot camps, like all that stuff. Um, we need that. Um, and most importantly, we need making. Um, I'm really passionate about this. Uh, I just think we need to like we need to just make stuff quickly and test it out, and it'll be rubbish in the first generation, um, in the way that new teachers are rubbish in their first couple of years, um, but they're brilliant in year five. Um, so we need to uh, make stuff, make stuff, rapid prototyping. These are all very very tested models from enterprise. It's not news to a lot of people in the room, um, and this is not a plug. But this is something that I'm making because I, um, I, uh, I'm, I, got, I, I was on retreat this new year. And around January the 2nd, I said, I thought, I've been thinking about this idea about mobile meditation for a while. And if someone else does it, doesn't, if I don't do it, someone else will do it. And it'll be less good than the one that I do. So I just, I just made, the, I made the commitment. I'm not going to go on retreat this year. I'm going to make a mobile app. Um, and it will be, you, you might love it. You might hate it. Um, and, uh, but I just think it's, it's an, it's a, it, well, the, the message is not that you can go to buddhify.com to find out about it. It, go, it launches it this, this autumn or fall. Um, and, uh, but the main thing is that I'm making something and I would really encourage my invitation to the room is let's make stuff because we've got the expertise. We have, um, we've got the networks. Um, we just need to corral, corral that a bit. 
And so Budify is just like one bit of the, like, it's just what, Budify does not promise the real deal. Budify is mindfulness with extra cheese and all this other extra stuff. Um, it's very simple guided meditations, but it's got some clever cleverness built, built into it, which I won't bore you with because it's not a pitch. But um, the, uh, we need a whole family of these things. Um, Budify is one, there's a bunch of other things coming up, but we need them uh, supported, directional, which is important. A flock of birds is directional. Um, that feels really important, and it's flexible. Um, so I'm working on one bit of it. I'd really invite um, everyone else to start working on the rest. Um, thank you. Thanks one again. Uh, once again.